How to design a car from the moment when the car designer draws it on a napkin in a coffee shop all the way to when a car actually rolls out of the production line. It's a long process and a lot goes into it. Uh, however, if I don't know if you noticed, the cars that we're driving around are not exactly stunning, right? So, for example, uh, this is uh, one of my most favorite car designs of all time. This is uh, Fisker Emotion Concept. Uh, designed by Henrik Fisker. Um, as you probably can tell, we don't see cars like this on the road very often because, you know, the process, the stuff that happens behind the closed door. So, I always wanted to find out, you know, what does it take to design a beautiful car and bring it to the market? So, I figured, why not invite one of the best people who can share information like this with us, the designer of this car himself, Henrik Fisker. As a matter of fact, we're going to be premiering his new segment on this channel. We're calling it the Design Studio with Henrik Fisker. He'll be joining other amazing contributors to this channel, uh, like Sandy Monroe, the CEO of Fair Day Future, Karsten Breifeld, uh, Rich Rebuilds, and so many others. So if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, uh, don't forget to click on that subscribe button and the bell notification icon so you don't miss any of this moving forward. Now, um, I know that Henrik is a polarizing figure in the electric car community. He's got his fans, he's got his critics, but I think everybody, both sides can agree on is that he knows how to design amazing cars and he's been in the, in the, in the industry for a long time. So I'm looking forward to talking to him about you know the art of designing cars and the process and and differences and designing different types of cars gas versus electric and and so forth so we got so many topics to discuss and i'm looking forward to that today we're going to be talking about what does it take to design a beautiful car and bring it to market? Before that, a quick reminder that this video and this channel is sponsored by Evanex, the aftermarket accessories for Tesla. Use E4 Electric as a discount code for all of your purchases over $100. All right, without further ado, let me bring in Henrik. Hey, Henrik, welcome to the premiere of your segment here on E4 Electric. Good to be here, Alex. Looking forward to it. All right, so let's talk about something that I think everybody, everybody who's ever driven a car or seen a car wonders, which is how do you make a good looking car? You know, there are some cars out there that are just pieces of art and there's some cars out there, you know, might, some might say uh, uh, like Toyota Prius, for example, that are just not so pleasing to the eyes. So what happens, you know, in the design studios of these cars you know, to, to either come up with a really good looking car or not so good looking car. And, and, and who makes the final call? Well, I think obviously if there was a simple recipe for a, how to design a good looking car, then everybody would do it. Uh, it's not so simple. And, and I think one of the reasons is that uh, there is most of the time, a lot of different cooks in the kitchen. And of course, there's also a lot of different um, goals that different departments have for a specific project. It could be a goal of, you know, maximum trunk capacity, a, a goal of fitting five grown-ups in the people and have a certain amount of head clearance. And it, it could be a cost goal as well. Um, and, and even something like, for instance, the turning uh, radius of a vehicle can determine maybe a shorter wheelbase, a narrower track, smaller wheels, kind of all the stuff a designer doesn't like. Um, so there's always going to be a lot of compromises um, in developing a car. And in the end of the day, um, I would say the CEO of a car company should make the final decision, but that's not always the case because in some car companies, the CEO may not feel comfortable doing that. So he leaves it to somebody else. Uh, it should then potentially be a, a chief designer, but that's not always the case. A lot of time you have marketing and, and cost people and engineering and, and all kind of other people who has opinions as well. So, so there's not a real clear answer. It varies from company to company. So now are there focus groups? Like do, 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 does a company show it to most likely customers, something like they do in politics, right? focus groups and then determine whether or not you know people thought that the car is good looking or maybe the looks are not as important uh, when we're talking about like minivans for example how does that work 
Well, so focus groups are very difficult. Um, I think it's very difficult to digest the data from a fo focus group correctly. And also focus group, uh, focus groups obviously uh, consist of people that will make a certain determination or an opinion in this moment of time. However, reality is the focus groups are usually done if you truly want to be able to have feedback from a photos focus group and be able to implement some of these things into the vehicle, you kind of need to do a focus group at least maybe one and a half year or two years ahead of the car coming out, which means people are deciding on something that they may like today, but they may not agree with that two years from now. So an example would be if you show me a tie that is five inches wide today, I will most likely say as, as any person that probably isn't going to look good and I don't think I want to buy it. But if in two years, all the top, you know, fashion designers in the world makes ties as five inches wide, we might all rock around with those ties and think they look really cool. So we couldn't have predicted that. So therefore those type of decisions when it comes to design is very difficult to make them work in focus groups when it comes to other things like a user interface or, certain other attributes sometimes that's a little easier but design is very difficult to to actually have people to decide on the focus group so now do designers or do companies know what others are working on for example you know let's say uh, do bmw designers know what mercedes is working on so that way they can also gauge what might be cool or what also is coming uh, to the market in the next two or three years or everyone's kind of working in their own sandbox? So I think it used to be that the designers from different companies had a fairly good idea about what was going on. Not exactly, uh, more in terms of proportions and sort of trends, because things were moving a little more consistently. And also most of the traditional car companies would, you just mentioned BMW, they would make the next generation BMW 3 Series and Audi would make the next generation Audi A4 and Mercedes make the next generation C-Class and everybody knew they were going to be each adding five millimeters more to the headroom and so on. And kind of people knew what, what some of the, the trends were. But I think this has changed dramatically, uh, mainly because you have seen some new car companies coming into the scene and it has changed with electrification, which completely has reset the game. And I think today uh, most company, uh, uh, most designers sitting in, in different car companies do not know what the others are making. Uh, sometimes they'll get a preview of some, somebody shows a show car, but uh, they, they really don't know. Well, you mentioned the electric cars, right? So one of the things that we've noticed that, uh, you know, electric cars don't really need a grill, at least as big of a grill as as the, the gas cars need. Um, how how can a, a designer right now sitting and working for an electric car company know if removing the grill and doing something else with the front end, as you know, many companies already tried, uh, if it's going to be appealing to people or people still like the grill and you just have to kind of, uh, you know, seal it and, and still make it look like there is a grill. And does that depend on the target audience? So let's first start with the misconception that an electric car doesn't need air to come into cooling various things inside the vehicle with us the battery the electric motors the air condition needs air so you will notice on pretty much all electric cars whether it's tesla porsche fisk or whoever it might be that's designed an electric car there is definitely some sort of opening for air uh, it may just be in the bottom of the car and obviously what happened from way back uh, in the old days, there was no bumpers on cars, so the grills, uh, you know, became sort of the dominating part of a vehicle. When then the bumpers were introduced, really around sort of, you know, federal laws, etc., 60s, 70s, what happened then was specifically in, in 74 here in the U.S., the grill was actually moved on top of the bumper because the grill was part of the face of the car. And then what happened was. Uh, a lot of the efficiency with aerodynamics, et cetera, et cetera, really meant that the air actually was, it was much better to take the air in underneath the bumper. So the actual functional grill on most cars underneath the bumper and the grill on top of the bumper was less functional a lot of times. And sometimes they were functional, 
functional, but not really necessary. Now, what we have happened today is that we have been able to sort of disguise the bumper. We don't, because of soft noses and other ways to design a bumper, you don't really need a traditional bumper, although there's a beam in there behind the front fascia. Um, but the grill has still been part of the, the sort of brand identity for many cars. So um, this is maybe some of the difficulty for the traditional car makers. It may also be an opportunity to start redesigning their grills or looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, I think when it comes to pure EV makers that are new, uh, like Fisker, you know, we still we still need air, like I mentioned. So you will st you can obviously decide: Do you want to hide the fact you need air? You can do that by making a very very small, you know, uh, non recognizable, non distinctive opening in the bottom of the vehicle. Or you can make something fun with it, which we, we I did on the Fisker Ocean, where we kind of have a parametric pattern that that slowly opens up as you move down towards the lower part of the vehicle. So uh, in, in first glance, it might look slightly like a grill, but it's really just a cool pattern, uh, which is closed actually. There is no air coming in. Uh, and, and some people have sort of, uh, not really realized that and was surprised and thought there was a big grill in the car, but there really isn't. And I get the question a lot, why is there a grill? Well, the car do need air cooling. So who's normally, so you just mentioned the reg regulations, right? When if, if a government requiring different countries require something like a bumper or whatever, obviously that has to, you know, affect the design. But besides that, who's the biggest enemy of the design? Is it the engineers? It is the marketing guys? Uh, you know, who did you have to fight the most with, especially when you work for the legacy manufacturers? Well, first of all, I think there is a, a sort of a, a little bit of a bad excuse using uh, uh, rules and regulations. I think today, together with the engineers, designers uh, can find very smart ways to get around the rules and regulations. And the rules and regulations, by the way, are the same for everybody specifically if you sell your vehicle here in the US or in Europe. Um, so, you know, it's equal rules for everybody. Now, when it comes to then who is the biggest enemy, I, I don't really think there should be any enemies uh, when it comes to designing and developing and engineering a car because it's a collabor collaborative effort. In the end of the day, uh, you have certain targets for this vehicle, whether it's two or four or five or seven people who has to fit in the car. You know, you got all these targets. I think the real key is how well does this team work together? That's the number one. And are they able to actually get the best out of each area of the vehicle? And then the final thing is, um, what is the, how does the leadership of the company look like? And, and what does the brand stand for? And in the end of the day, that will determine where the pendulum swings when you have to make a decision. What is important for this brand? So let's say you may have a brand where ultimate interior space is number one for this brand, which means that if the designer asked to lower the roof 10 millimeter to make it look better, they may decide absolutely not because ultimate air, you know, interior space is number one. Or if ultimate off-road capability is number one and designer says, I would like to make the car look low to the ground. That may be a point where the leadership of this company says no, because we need this car to be fully off-road capable. So it needs to have a minimum ground clearance of that. And then of course you have the other pendulum swinging the other side where uh, uh, specifically the visual impact of a vehicle um, is a, of huge importance to the brand. And there's you know many brands out there. Uh, I've worked for a couple where you had certain degrees of importance and therefore there would be certain conces concessions. Uh, and that, that becomes really, really difficult because now you're working on making a decision which is not really a formula, a calculation where you have a clear outcome after you have calculated it. So it's really an emotional decision. It's a risk-taking decision about do I think that people will get swayed because this car is so cool and I will live with those little things or will I go and buy the competitor's car that's more ugly but has slightly more, let's say, headroom? So those are the type of difficult things that decisions you have to make throughout the development of vehicle. And again, it truly depends on, on, on the brand. And I know sometimes I get people on 
on, on my social media going, well, I don't care. Just give me all the best interior space. And why are you doing this? And I mean, if that was the truth that nobody cared about the looks of a car, you know, we would all be driving minivans because that is truly the best and most efficient use of space. But the fact is we're not all driving minivans and we're not all, you know, buying a car for only $22,000 or $18,000. There's people who spend a lot more on cars and many of those reasons are not really total rational reasons. That is true. We are not totally rational beings, uh, believe it or not. I, and yes, I'm glad that not all of us drive minivans that would be uh, that would be pretty sad, I think. But uh, uh, listen, thank you so much for shining some light on this because uh, I think obviously people know people think that stuff like this is much easier than it really is, and and it's interesting when you I'm sure like now that we had this conversation, I'll but once I'm driving outside, I'll I'll be looking at the cars in a in a different way. Great talk to you, Alex. Looking forward to the next segment. All right. Now we know why not every single car on the road is uh, stunning. And, and I guess this is a process that we kind of have to live with. And, and I understand, you know, I, I you know, it, and, and I guess this also also shows that, you know, legacy manufacturers will will have harder time coming up with uh, more, uh, not just beautiful, but sort of futuristic concepts, right? For example, look at Tesla. They were able to uh, come up with all these designs very quickly, including the Cybertruck. Do you ever see Cybertruck ever passing that process of the legacy manufacturer? I don't think so. By the way, the car in this picture is a Fisker Ocean, and uh, Henrik is uh, taking reservations for the car. If you want to reserve one, I'll put a link in the description of this video. And let me give you a quick preview of what's coming up in a couple of days so that my next video is something that I just taped today. And then I, I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen the footage of this beauty right here. Now, this is a salvaged. Uh, really beyond salvage model 3 this is a performance and this is the fastest tesla model 3 in the world because as you can see it's pretty much stripped however everything in this car functions perfectly like you can drive it uh, the monitor works uh, the, the, the the it, it you can charge and supercharge it so uh, i i came over to the shop that's actually um has this car they actually selling it through through an ebay auction but uh i got to drive it and uh, uh, wow you can you can feel it you can feel the air because there is no windshield or a roof really anymore uh you can feel the torque <laughs> that way so uh don't forget to tune in for that and of course the best way to do that is to uh, click that subscribe button and the bell notification icon so you don't miss fun videos like this moving forward all right looking forward to your comments including some suggestions on topics to talk about uh with henrik in the future episodes other than that see you guys next time and remember to stay charged